Hi, this is Mauricio Rosas. This is a short clip of today's meeting for the downtown interchange in I-275 construction. This portion is where Secretary Gwynn discusses the subject matter. Thank you very much. Um, before we move on, I've just been informed that Secretary Gwynn is on the line and would like to speak to the TPO board uh, related to some of this morning's public comment. And then I will look around if commissioners uh, or um, council members or other M TPO board members uh, want to ask questions or make comments. Secretary Gwynn, are you there? Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you for joining us this morning. No, thank you. And and we will be and plan to come to the uh, to the board next month to, to talk about certain topics. But um, based on some of the public comments today, some of the comments that have been circulating through um, various uh, forums, I did want to provide some information perhaps for, for the board to consider before we have our discussions next month to put things in perspective and hopefully be able to have a more informed discussion. So if it's all right with uh, you, Mr. Chair, I'd like to talk about briefly about three issues that I know have been brought up as um, topics of discussion. The first topic has to do with the downtown interchange and the um, the fact that there are going to be some areas where the uh, the walls are going to be moved. And I started writing down some of the comments I heard in public uh, comment, um, dishonest, um, deceptive, uh, non-collaborative. Um, first of all, I want to I want to say that over the last five years, I have tasked my team to be completely transparent, to be collaborative, and to make sure that we are open and honest with the public about everything that we do. I also want to say just because people say things over and over and over and over and over again, it doesn't mean that it's true. We have never, ever shown anything to the public that did not show that we were going to be moving the walls. They were called out by graphics in our public meetings. I'm sorry that if some folks feel like they did not understand it, but when it has a big arrow that shows wall moved, we said not that we were gonna stay within the existing footprint. There's no way you can add lanes within the existing footprint of that interchange. What we said is we would not impact the right of way. Five years ago, I committed and I committed to this board and I committed to the community that we would take a very hard look at the concepts that were being considered. What we used to call concepts and in, 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 in alternatives A and B. And then we developed C and D, which were not as impactful, but certainly still had impacts to the community. And we finally came up with what we thought was a very good collaborative um, solution, which was to take out the express lanes north of I-4 and to not take any additional right-of-way in Tampa Heights, but to try to utilize the existing right-of-way as, as well as we could to address the safety and operational concerns within, within the interchange. To be able to address those thousand crashes a year that occur that we're trying to find ways to mitigate. Now, I know it isn't perfect and not everybody likes it, but I can tell you that in addition to just being able to stay within our right-of-way, we made the commitment to do what we could to help to mitigate some of this in the Tampa Heights community. We have invested millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars in infrastructure improvements into Tampa Heights. We, in, we went ahead and submitted and supported a raise grant. The DOT submitted a raise grant for $25 million for the federal government to provide improvements within the Tampa Heights area. And when the federal government came back and said, we can't give you 25 million, we'll give you 18 million, we stepped up and provide the other 7 million. We fought and along with you, we're able to find $68 million to help support the expansion of the streetcar into Tampa Heights. That's the state match before we even had the local match, which is an extremely hard argument to make. We did that. We made the streetcar free to help make the federal funding more attractive by rising, uh, increasing the ridership. We have done everything we can and although I don't really care if somebody wants to call me out and call me uh, the dishonest and all those things, but I don't feel it's fair to my team. My team has done everything they can to try to be as collaborative, 
and to try to be as transparent as possible. So on the, in regards to the downtown interchange, we are only working within our existing right away and we worked hard to keep as much of a buffer as we can. There will, There is nowhere where it's gonna be less than 15 feet between the existing roadway and our walls. There's room in there to put, to put landscaping. Is it perfect? No, but nothing was gonna be perfect. We found a good compromise. So in terms of the downtown interchange, we've already shortlisted teams to move forward. We will continue to work closely with the community but I do uh, find, find, find that the comments that were made were just not true. I don't believe we're the ones being dishonest in terms of what was shown to the public. We were very transparent. The seven, second topic I wanted to address, we're gonna come next month with very good alternatives, we feel, to look at the Robles Park noise wall situation. The truth is there is no opportunity for federal or state funds for the noise wall. And the reason is, is because it does not meet the federal requirements for a noise wall. Yeah. Beth knows this. We've talked to FHWA. She cannot use her federal funds. We cannot use our federal funds. And because the state funds follow the federal funds requirements, we can't use the state funds for that. The truth is, and I would not recommend this, but the truth is, is the only funds that could be used in that area to build an actual noise wall are local funds. We wouldn't stand in your way if you wanted to do that, but I don't necessarily recommend you do. We are gonna to bring to you options that we can do with state funds. There's an opportunity to look at a, what you would call a privacy wall, a wall that's not necessarily as tall as a noise wall, but it provides some of the benefits and it provides some of the visual barrier. We're gonna bring you options related to landscaping opportunities and trellis walls and things that we think could be a good solution but there's just no opportunity. There is no way for us to be able to put state or federal funds. This is a policy that's been used throughout the entire state. There's not precedent for us to be able to do a noise wall where it's not federal, meet the federal requirements and we don't make the federal requirements. So I, 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 I know that that's frustrating. I know that sometimes it doesn't make sense, but that's the rules we have to follow. We'll give you alternatives next month. So I hope you'll think about that when we talk about it, that the noise wall, unless the locals want to pay for it, really isn't an option. So let's find what we can do and, and find the best solution that we can. The last thing is the um, the home that um, that is scheduled for demolition. Um, this home is not being demolished because of the need of the SEIS. That's not the purpose for it to be demolished. Um, this, this structure is currently very structurally unsound and it's been a public nuisance. We've had, uh, by the number of police calls that have, have been called out there. We have tried very hard to find someone, an investor that would move the home, rehab the home. And we just have not been able to find anybody that said that, that it, it's even feasible to do. There's many problems I could go into. There's black mold. I wanted to take a tour of the building and take a look at it myself. And they tell me I can't even go up to the second floor because it's so, so structurally unsound that you can't go up to the second floor. I will also tell you that we bought this property in, in, in 2015 from a willing seller and the structural and, and inspections that were done at that time shown that these conditions existed at that time. It may have gotten worse since then, but at that time it was not structurally sound. It also is not, it's a, it's a stucco on wood type of a structure. And what we've been told is if you try to move that, chances are it could collapse on itself because the stucco won't, won't, won't stay attached to it. You almost have to remove the stucco, which makes it un, unstable. There's just a lot of problems with that house. We, and I did give the local, um, uh, association 60 days to try to find their own. We've had years to look for somebody and haven't found somebody. If they can find somebody that will move it, then we're more than willing to do that. But I, I just don't think we will. And to have it just sit there and continue to deteriorate, I don't think is a good solution. So unless we can find someone that, that wants to rehab and move that home, we're more than willing to work with them if they want to, but I just don't think we're going to. I hate that we have to tear down any structure. But when it becomes a public nuisance, when it's a structural and safety hazard, we have to be responsible and we have to take action. So that is the plan, unless we hear something different from the, the local community association, as far as someone that wants to try to take that on. 
Um, next month, we can talk in more detail, but I do just want to say, I hope we don't fall back into the same type of dialogue we had years ago, where it became very negative. It became very, very contentious. I can tell you, I honestly have tried very hard, and I think my staff have too, to do everything we can to be collaborative in the community. I know it's not perfect, and I know a lot of people don't like what we're doing, but we have to find a way to compromise. It's not always going to be our way or their way. We have to find a way to compromise, and I do think we've made so much progress. I don't think we want to rehash everything that's been already finally decided over the last few years over and over and over again. I think we need to move forward. We'll continue to look for ways to work with the community to improve things, but I just don't want to see where we end up getting back where we were five years ago. I don't think that will do anybody any good. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to allow us to speak. Secretary Gwynn, thank you very much for those comments. And, and also, uh, I, I know all of us appreciate the idea that we can get into this in more detail in January. Are, it, knowing that we have a full agenda this morning, are there uh, any commissioners that have any comments yes, they would like to make? Yes. Yes, Commissioner Oberman? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, thank you, Secretary Glenn, for, for answering a lot of the questions that I think were addressed not only locally on social media, but also in today's public comment. Uh, there is an opportunity, because I do know that they're already reconfiguring the underpasses, the roads on Chelsea and Osborne and, and Hillsborough, and that work has already begun. So I'm very glad that you were able to show up today because between now and a month from now, much of that work would have already been done. Um, there is an opportunity, I think, for FDOT to work with the community on uh, the underpass design and the artwork associated with it. And I'm, I'm getting wind from various folks in the community that that partnership hasn't really evolved in a, in a more positive way. So I would ask, and not to say it's negative, it just hasn't moved in a positive way. Seminole Heights is, and Tampa Heights is a very, very artistic community. Um, there's a lot of folks that are very involved in art. And we know that other overpass and underpass designs have collaborated with the communities of which they were, they were changed. So I would ask that that effort be made um, and to give us um, in their report next month some idea of how that was done um, and actually work with clarifying the noise walls and the alternatives for the walls over Robles Park. We recognize that is, but having a dollar amount that we have to shoot for, given the various different alternatives that you will bring back to us, will help the community make a realistic decision on what they really would like to see in that effort. So thank you very much. Commissioner Kemp, and, and, and then I'll. And, and I'll be fast. I, I just, on that property, and I've heard a lot about it, um, 1902 Lamar, I think is the address. Um, and I, my, my question was, because I've dealt with this in Seminole Heights some 20 years ago with the widening of Hillsborough Avenue and uh, properties were kept empty for years and said that they were, uh, it was unfeasible to do anything with them. And we ended up, actually one of them was Dale Mabry's home, which is now on Suwanee Avenue moved. Another one was a historic home in the neighborhood, Dr. Stone's and was cut in half. And so my question is, is this, if that, and that property, I don't know the condition of it, I'm no expert, <laughs> um, but I'm just wondering if, if it is impossible to move, but could be restored on site, is there any possibility that that, that uh, land could be made available um, with the property on it for someone to restore? that and you don't have to answer that now but it's just kind of the first question that came to mind for me thank you commissioner well, commissioner myers thank you mr chair i'd just like to ask secretary gwen if he would consider holding another community engagement meeting with the residents it appears that the residents um are saying that they didn't know what was going on or were not informed and if you can hold another meeting just to clarify everything that you've said this morning with the residents and be prepared to come to our meeting next month. Thank you. I will, if I could answer the question here. Yes, yeah, Secretary Gwen. So um, we would be glad to continue to work with the community. Um, we had a recent meeting uh, where, where our folks came out and, and talked. 
Um, we would hope that the organizers of the meeting, from both our side and from the community side, so would try to promote this as an opportunity for constructive conversation, as opposed to, um, you know, we don't mind, we know we're gonna show up sometimes and just people just wanna go out and blast on us, but we usually don't, nothing gets resolved with that. What we would like to do is sit down and have a conversation and, and talk, and perhaps a way to start that is with the leaders of the community so we can talk about some of the things and then try to to expand that out but um we, we're certainly open to having conversations and you know we talked about the artwork quite honestly the city is the one that leads the artwork we provide the opportunity the city is the one doing the public outreach for the artwork and, and all of that so we'd be glad to work with the city on that but that was the role the city wanted and, and took and as far as the home we can look at all options we've asked the, um, the, 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 the community association come back with us within 60 days of what, if they can find somebody who has a plan, we'll look at it, we'll look at it. But I can tell you that property's in bad shape. And if we can't find somebody that wants to take it on, then we're gonna have to tear it down. Commissioner Myers, did you wanna follow up with the secretary? Yes. If, um... Secretary Gwen, if you can let me know when that meeting will be held, I would like to attend just to be in support um, as a commissioner. And I'm pretty sure there might be other commissioners of this board might want to attend that meeting. I do agree we cannot accomplish anything when we're just showing up to go back and forth, but we can accomplish great things when we come together and discuss it in unity. Thanks so much. Yes, ma'am. Councilman Dingfelder. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I mentioned earlier it's the uh, thank you Guido 80th anniversary of uh, Pearl Harbor, but but uh, Mr. Secretary, I I agree with you. I hope that we we don't head toward another war on these issues. Um, uh, I I think that Secretary uh, Glenn, you, that you over the last five years, you and your team have done a really good job of of uh, changing the attitudes and the relationship. Um, between the community and, and the and the district and the DOT, and I commend you for that. Um, I think you've come a long way. Now, with that, I will say I do recall when I first came on the MPO, perhaps a year year or two ago, I recall a conversation that said when we do the interchange, we're not going to be going beyond the, the existing footprint. But I think what the problem is is what is the definition of the footprint. And I think what you're saying, Mr. Secretary, is the right of way footprint. The right of way footprint is not changing, but the actual highway footprint in terms of the, 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 uh, the, the wall and everything has to go out. So I think that that's probably just a miscommunication. I don't believe it was intentional. I'm sure that the drawings probably showed it and that people just missed it. And, and that's unfortunate. But that's miscommunication. I'm sure that can be resolved with additional communication as Commissioner Myers has suggested and, uh, and that we could all move forward and, and, uh, and, and avoid uh, going to war again because I don't think that's helpful. Thank you, sir. Councilman Mattis Kampel. Thank you very much. You know, I think it's imperative of our generation, all of us here, when it comes to historic preservation to really pay attention to it because if you look at the last half century all we've done is torn down and i remember having a conversation with a gentleman not going to name him he's still alive he's he's a, an older man and i said well you know you were there during all of this what about the art deco what about the the architecture of you know of the era the historic preservation and he laughed and he said there was no historic preservation it was an old building and we tore it down and we tore it down for parking lots. We tore it down for highways, whatever it was, but we tore down so much of our history on my desk at city hall. I have a life magazine from 1963 and there's an article there, uh, that headlines with, you know, erasing our history and all these beautiful structures from the late 1800s, early 1900s, this is 1963 as modern as 1930. So 30 years prior when this article was written, and it was old and it was demolished for something new. When I walked here today from City Hall, I noticed all the parking lots. And those parking lots used to be either hotels, used to be other structures that were not wooden structures that were delicate that you figure 
or the humidity in the tropical climate. They were brick structures made to last forever or for centuries, made by hands of skilled workers that were proud of what they built because they figured what I built today with my hands, future generations will enjoy. Getting back to this property here, and I appreciate all the comments of the secretary who has always been wonderful, uh, always been open in, 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 in communication. I won't criticize that, but it's up to us to preserve what we can. When I first got elected in 2015, and I'll finish here, I asked the mayor at the time, what about the Jackson House? First thing out of my mouth. And uh, there did not seem to be an interest. And at the time, the Jackson House was in much better shape than it is now. I have photos from a few months before getting elected, completely different uh, quality of the home. Now we look at it, and it's uh, wooden uh, trusses inside holding up the structure. And we may have waited too long. I hope that it is restorable. Um, but it's demolition by neglect. This structure here is a solid structure. The inside, maybe the floor is wooden and it's weak, but the exterior structure is, is block or brick, uh, brick that is meant to last a long time. I hope that in this uh, climate where so many people are making money on real estate, people are making a fortune. We see the real estate and property values that someone steps up and says, I want to do something with the structure. I can restore it, maybe make it into affordable housing units, micro apartments, something. If you go by Burns Steakhouse, there are what used to be apartments right there on Howard Avenue, and they're completely gutted out. Uh, the, the Burns organization purchased these, and they're redoing them. They gutted out the interior, but they saved the exterior. So when they're finished, you'll see this Mediterranean-style design from, I believe, the 1920s, but it's modernized inside where it's usable and it remains. It's not being torn down for parking or for parking garage. Uh, they're making good use of it. So again, if anybody is listening uh, and has the money and is willing to take on this project, which is not big, the structure is not big. I hope that they do so. I don't know about moving it, but maybe uh, FDOT will have a, a change of heart and perhaps um, sell the property without having to move it or demolish it and let somebody else handle it in the name of historic preservation. Thank you. So I, I this, think this morning, Mr. Chair, oh, excuse me. Yeah. Could, Secretary, Quinn, quick, is that you? Yes, sir. If I could just clarify one thing, because this is a, a common misconception that we hear. Um, the structure itself is wooden with stucco on the outside of the wood. It is not a, a block or a masonry building. That's part of the problem. If it was, it might be easier to move. The problem is, is that when you have stucco on the outside of wood, if you try to do anything to move it, the stucco basically falls off and then the wood becomes unstable and the home moves. In fact, most movers said they, have, they wouldn't move it without removing the stucco. So if there is someone looking to invest in it, they might want to check it out and look because it's actually a, a wooden structure with a stucco exterior. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kemp, you had a follow-up. And uh, I didn't mean to speak again, but I just think it's important for clarification because I feel it's fundamental. And I was always honestly abundantly aware of the fact that they talked um, not about footprint, but about the right of way that FDOT owned. So I never believed that it was going to be in the current footprint because I think as the secretary says, how could that be? So they talked about the right of way. And I think that that has been my focus actually for three or four years as I looked at this. And so I think it's really important to um, be recognizing that because I'll, I'll say that that is one of the things that I was talking about when we're talking about 275 North is they always said, well, we're not taking down homes, but you know, it's in the right of way we had, you cannot add 15 foot lanes on either side of 275 North, 30 feet more of asphalt and pavement all the way up and not widen the footprint. How would you do that? I just, you know, I just think that that has always been um, fundamental to the conversation. So I just don't want any um, misconceptions about um, uh, our information about, because I thought that was really basic to the conversation uh, that we've been having all along to this and really fundamental. So I just wanted to clarify that point so that it wasn't lost. 
Well, th thank you for that, Commissioner Kemp. And I think that underscores what Councilman Dinkelder was saying earlier. You know, I think the comments by this board show that everyone is being very thoughtful about these issues as they're being raised. I think it's very, very good news that Secretary Gwynn seems amenable to Commissioner Meyer's suggestion to have a community meeting and create some dialogue. Um, I, I just want to say that people have mentioned Pearl Harbor today. I uh, have been struck by the coverage of the passing of Senator Bob Dole. Um, if you if you read about or, or saw any of the coverage, it was really about his really unique ability over the years to bring people together across party lines and across divides in order to get things actually done. And one of the things that was raised was that he worked across party lines um, with Senator Moynihan to save Social Security in the 1980s. You know, the spirit of collaboration and cooperation that um, I think all of us want to see here, um, you know, harkens back to a time of, like that when people got together and not everybody can get everything they want, but we can find ways to find common ground and find compromise. I hope when the community meets, uh, that 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 will uh, that will take place and and more than anything I think it's really good that we now know that at our next meeting we're going to get into the details of these um, of these projects once again to make sure that there are that there are no misunderstandings but I I, I also think that Commissioner Kemp's uh, point was a very important one that that uh, the issue of right of way versus current envelope, um, is uh, was very, very significant in terms of coming to these solutions to begin with. Remember, the original proposals involved huge takings throughout the community that are no longer on the table. So with that, we will uh, we will we'll all learn more and we will come back together again on this item uh, after the new year. Uh, with that, we are going to move on to our consent agenda. Uh, the first item is.